Before the sun and moon were charged to count the days, no sky crowned the land below, and no flesh and thought lingered in the emptiness of Ginana Gap, the void of everything. To the sides of Ginana Gap were the realms of elemental fire and elemental frost, Muspelheim and Niflheim, respectively. To imagine either is to see the world around you, made from a single thing, in its purest form. The fires of Muspelheim raged and roared unchecked, while the freezing wasteland of Niflheim stood silent and unstirred, its clear skies shimmering with frost. By chance or intent, the fires of Muspelheim spread from its blazing home, and the ice of Niflheim crawled from its cold prison. Their only path was towards Ginane Gap. In the middle of the void, the hottest and unchained flames licked and struck the coldest and harshest frost. An explosion of water followed, creating nothing into something. The first being to ever exist filled the black expanse with the first scream of birth. This creature was called Ymir, the Screamer, a being both man and woman, a giant so massive that only the world could rival its glory. Under its skin of eternal frost, beat a heart like a red furnace, spreading the flames of Muspelheim throughout the giant's veins. As Ymir wandered Ginana Gap, a cloud of vapor followed him, and ice melted from its pores in great waterfalls. Every night, when Ymir slept, creatures such as giants were washed out from its pores and birthed into existence. One of these creatures was the celestial cow, at Humla, who found nourishment in the salty ice of Ymir's skin, who in turn, supped upon the cow's milk. As the cow licked, a new being, the first of the Isa gods, Uri, cracked free from Ymir's skin, and inhaled for the first time. Uri became known as the forefather of all Isa. His grandson Odin, along with his brothers, wandered the void in the puddles and clouds of Ymir, a being as bright and hot as the sun, but as uncaring and indifferent to those around, as the coldest glacier. Ymir trampled as many as it created, but paid neither thought nor attention. Odin, the heir of the Isa, saw the pain of those around the senseless destruction, and felt sorrow for the giant's victims. An end had to be put to the chaos, and order brought into existence. Thus, Odin hatched a plan along with his brothers, Vili and Ve, to fell the giant, and build a home to its neglected offspring. Ymir possessed strength beyond all of its creations combined a thousandfold, but its mind was no more than that of a massive insect. The three Isa brothers struck from three directions, tearing holes into Ymir from whence the fires of Muspelheim burst into Ginana Gap, as they did during the giant's birth. Ymir screamed and swung in blind confusion, but could do nothing against the overwhelming assault then finally fell in a pile of sputtering pieces of ice and molten flame. From the body parts of Ymir, the three brothers created the world, Midgard, which sprang into life instantly, from the giant's fertile essence. They created the seas from his blood, the mountains from his bones, stones from his teeth, the sky from his skull, and the clouds from his brain. Four dwarfs held up his skull, and it became the heavens, and his eyebrows became the fence surrounding Midgard, the home of mankind. As the world grew, so were the first mortals created from an elm and an ash, called Embla and Ask. Once all was in good order, the Isa built their home above the clouds, to watch and govern over their creation, and in this realm, they built their great hall, Valhalla. Midgard's days were tranquil and uneventful, as all living things flourished and the Isa multiplied.
Odin, the father of men, the king of the Aesir, the lord of the gods, the lord of the dead, the attacking rider, the shield shaker, the blazing eyed one, the one who rides forth, the god protector, the battle blinder, the one of the host, the hanged god, the victory bringer, the father of the slain, the mighty old man, the one eyed one. Once upon a time, Odin slew the father of his grandfather, the two gendered giant of ice and fire, Ymir. Then, he and his fellow Aesir set about to create Midgard from the bones, blood and flesh of the primordial being. Once creation stood glorious under the sky, the Allfather sat on his throne of Lidsjalfin, in the realm of Asgard, the highest of the nine realms. But, for Asgard to rule over the other realms, Odin sought Mimir, the master of hidden law. Mimir offered Odin the path to complete his ambition with the sacrifice of his left eye. As his bloody eyeball fell into the well of Mimir, he saw that in order for him to rule all of the nine realms, he would have to sacrifice himself and be reborn after death. After devising the most sensible plan to accomplish this, Odin fell on his own spear, Grangnir, and hung himself by the neck on one of the boughs, Yggdrasil, the world tree, for nine days. His agonizing endeavor complete, Odin climbed down, and all nothing was a secret to his mind. The realms were in his grasp. As the master of death, Odin's halls are the home of the spirits of Midgard's dead as well. Thus, his home came to be known as Valhalla, the halls of the dead. By his decree, all those who died in honorable battle would find their eternal home in Asgard, in a never-ending orgy of battle, feasting, and drinking. Thor, the wielder of the hammer, Mjolnir, son of Odin, the strong archer, the one who rides alone, the mighty thunder, the one with the wide forehead, the loud rider, the guardian of the shrine. Thor is a fearsome warrior of flaming locks of red hair and a mighty red beard. As his wagon, dragged by two goats, Tangrisnir and Tangyoster, rolled across the sky, from adventure to adventure, his hammer spat thunder and lightning. The goats also provided him with sustenance. After a stout slam of Mjolnir on the animals' heads, the thunder god needed only spare the bones and skin after his feast. The goats would grow flesh inside their skin and around their bones during the night and stood pristine and unharmed the next morning. What motivated Thor was simple. He enjoyed fighting, merrymaking, food, drink, and lovemaking, in that order. Where one of these could be had, the carriage of the Thunder Lord was not far. This single-minded reckless and pleasure-seeking behavior led him to many misadventures, tragedies, and outright disasters, often involving his anger, then his hammer, in quick succession. No one knew the bite of Mjolnir better than Jormungandr, the world serpent. Once upon a time, Thor went fishing with the Jotun, Hymir, a giant, in a competition to win his titanic beer brewing cauldron, of infinite drink. Thor caught the world serpent, and hoisted it on Hymir's boat. Angered by his loss, Hymir tossed the world serpent back into the ocean of Midgard, denying Thor his prize of eternal drunkenness. Thor, angered by the loss of his catch, and such a vile betrayal, slew Hymir with Mjolnir, and took his cauldron. Jormungandr would forever bear a grudge towards Thor and the rest of the Aesir. In Ragnarok, the end of the world, the world serpent would find his revenge by biting Thor, envenoming him, but fell from the wounds caused by Mjolnir.
Loki, the thief of the giants, the foe of the gods, the forger of evil, the sly one, the bound one, the slanderer and cheat of Asgard. If a situation has a chance for mischief or personal gain, through the undermining of another, the trickster of the Aesir was not far away. It remains to be seen whether the Bane of Asgard seeks his own glory through subterfuge, or if it is only his nature to be a divine pain. Loki was the son of the Jotun, Farbauti, and the Aesir, Laufi, a woman clothed in fiery leaves and nettles. Often, Loki is referred to as Thor's brother, but nothing could be farther from the truth. Even with his Aesir heritage, the trickster only visited the halls of his extended family to spread discord and general annoyance. The masters of Asgard were never happy to see him in one of their feasts. Once upon a time, during a gloomy feast after the death of Balder the Beautiful, Thor had enough of Loki's drunken insults and vile comments and threatened to smack the evil Guttermouth's head off his shoulders and toss his remains far to the east, where no one has to endure the sight of him ever again. Loki of course taunted the thunder god more, even slipping from his mouth the truth of the death of Balder and ran away, disguised as a salmon down a waterfall from Asgard. Thinking he had escaped the wrath of the Aesir, Loki rested at the base of the fall. However, his pursuers were not far behind, trapping Loki in the grip of a horrible serpent, whose venom dripped from its mouth and burned Loki's skin like acid. The trickster would find a way to escape his torment and fight alongside the Jotnar against the Aesir in the flames of Ragnarok. Freya, Lady of the Vanir, the fiercely bright one, the goddess of love, beauty and fertility. She hails from the realm of Vanaheim, home of the Vanir. Unlike the mighty Aesir, the Vanir were great sorcerers and magicians. Freya, the head of the Vanir, practiced a special kind of magic known as Seda, which she discovered and taught to the Vanir and the elves. This magic could weave and unravel the well-being, desires, and fates of any being the practitioner sets their hands upon, and none could resist the touch of Freya. When the Aesir had established themselves in Asgard, Freya sought them out with the rest of her order and offered the magical services of the Vanir in exchange for gold and other pleasures. The lords of Asgard used the great powers of the Vanir to gain an upper hand on their brothers and sisters, until the halls of Odin were filled with heavy silence, shadows, and betrayal. One could pay for Avania's services, but what if another paid more? Odin had enough of the discord of his kin, and demanded the Vanir to pay equal tribute to every lord of Asgard and atone for their dishonorable actions. A squabble ensued, leading to the Aesir Vanir War where terrible magics and the flames of battle ravaged the realms of Asgard and Vanaheim. In the end, where no side could claim victory, Odin made a truce with Freya, taking her brother Frey as hostage, while giving Mimir the law master to the Vanir in return. Balder the Princely, Balder the Shining, the beautiful god of light, joy and purity, son of Odin and his wife, Frigg. The Vanir might have been masters in subtlety and the craft of word, but even they paled in comparison to the lord of poetry of the Aesir. Balder stood tall, lean and fair as porcelain, 
with a head of beautiful blonde locks and a pair of rosy lips from where sweet poetry flowed out like golden honey. His visage caused hearts to skip, no matter the race or state of life. Poetry and the arts of the scold were appreciated in all the realms, but what the Aesir valued most was Balder's gift of premonition. While the Aesir were mighty warriors with enchanted weapons and armor, strong enough to withstand the mightiest blows, cunning, guile and magic could bring down even the strongest within Odin's host. But Balder could see the plans of the enemy. His gaze burned through all deceit and mystery, while his mouth revealed the truth. So valuable was the gift that Balder's mother, Frigg, wove an enchantment over him. He would be invulnerable to blades and arrows, hot and cold. He would feel neither pain nor the wasting of age. This enchantment brought joy to the Aesir, who took merriment in shooting the scold with arrows, axes and rocks, while he stood still and sang poetry, without a hint of a flinch. It remains a mystery whether the Aesir enjoyed this festivity more than Balder's poetry. Loki, clever as he was, found the only weakness of Balder, the only thing Frigg forgot to protect her son from. Gathering mistletoe from the east of Midgard, Loki fashioned the plant into arrows. Disguised as a blind old man, he entered Asgard and presented a wager that he would be the one to slay Balder with an arrow, asking Thor to point him in the direction of the target. The arrow found its mark and Balder was slain, never to be seen in the realms of the living, until after Ragnarok. Tyr, the one-handed Aesir, son of Hymir the Jotun, the god of war, law, honor, and glory. A Norse warrior wishing victory in battle would be wise to pray to Tyr. Even while crippled, none could best him in armed combat, and none could match his bravery. It was just his bravery and willingness to put his health and well-being on the line that left him with only his sword arm. Back when Tyr could still hold a shield, the wolf, Fenris, son of Loki, ran rampant in Asgard, causing mischief, murdering unearthly livestock, and generally befouling the realm with his vile presence. Council after council of the Aesir came to no conclusion as to what was to be done with the beast. Many, such as Thor, suggested the mangy horror be put down with a hammer, but Odin denied such plan, claiming Fenris was not worth spilling blood on the pure realm of Asgard. A thought bounced around, that until a proper way to dispose of Fenris came about, the beast should be chained and bound until that time. But Fenris was no ordinary wolf, so he could not be trapped as any wild animal. The Aesir came before the great wolf and presented him with a challenge, preying on his arrogance. They claimed the wolf to be the mightiest of wolves, but were wondering if he could break any set of chains put upon him. Fenris took the bait and challenged the Aesir to bind him so that he could not break free, but were they to find such a chain that could hold him, they would have to swear an oath to release him. The Aesir, fingers crossed behind their backs, agreed. Twice was Fenris bound, and twice he escaped, breaking the links as if they were twigs. Out of ideas, the Aesir commissioned all the dwarves of the realms to construct a devious and clever chain. The masters of mining, crafting arts and deep places, did as they were asked and called their creation Plyknir. If one is skilled enough in handicrafts, they too may attempt to forge this unbreakable chain using these items, the sound of a cat's footfall, the beard of a woman, the roots of a mountain, the sinews of a bear, the breath of a fish, and the spittle of a bird. 
impossible for a mortal, but a day's work for a dwarf. The Aesir looked at the chain in shock, it was no more than a bright and slender length of cloth. However, Thor, strong as he was, could not rip the cloth apart, and neither could Tyr's sword cut through it. This wondrous thing had promise. Once again, the Aesir came before Fenris, during one of his rampages, and challenged him to break free of the enchanted cloth. Smelling the cloth to be of some craft beyond ordinary metal making and weaving, the great wolf added a clause to his wager. In addition to the previous oath to let him free, one of them must place their arm in his mouth as collateral. The Aesir looked at one another, none, wishing to put their arm on the rancid black tongue and between the vile yellow and black teeth of the beast. Tear, without hesitation, volunteered, placing his arm on the massive tongue of Fenris. Bound by Gleipnir, Fenris could not break or slip from his fetter. The Aesir laughed, while Tyr's forehead glittered with beads of sweat. Enraged, Fenris clamped his jaw and took Tyr's arm, much to the surprise of his peers. Frigg, mother of the gods, wife of Odin, queen of the Aesir, goddess of marriage and domestic arts. The fair wife of Odin is a powerful Aesir, almost matched in power by Freya of the Vanir. As with Balder, her son, she too possessed the power of foresight, but not as potent. Balder was her dearest son and greatest treasure. So much did Frigg care for him that she petitioned for her boy to be invulnerable. The Aesir, loving Balder for his gift and pleasant nature, advocated for her wish and brought her case to the Thing, a meeting of powerful beings. At the Thing, Frigg took oaths from every tree and bush, every disease and ailment, metals from copper to steel, vowed to never bring harm to Balder, along with the rocks that bore them. Even the winds, flames and rivers, swore they would not mar his skin. Loki, eavesdropping, as was his custom, heard the oath swearing and felt envy towards this upstart. This golden-haired foolish boy, who was given all the praise and protection in the world, while he, a self-made Aesir of his intelligence and prowess, was left to sculpt the realms and apologize for everything he did. Disguised as an old woman, Loki stole his way to Frigg and asked what had occurred in the Council of All Things. Frigg revealed, in her pride, that her charming words convinced everything living and lifeless to swear never to hurt her and Odin's son, Balder, listing all who swore. Loki, attentive as he was, heard the list and noticed Frigg made a mistake. One thing out of everything that made up the realms had not sworn the oath, mistletoe. Leaving Frigg with no knowledge of this, Loki went to gather mistletoe and fashioned arrows to kill Balder. After his next transformation to a blind old man, he shot the great skald in the heart, killing him and leaving Frigg in inconsolable despair, retching in tears. Heimdall, the watchman of Asgard, the whitest skinned of the gods, the god of watchfulness, sight, hearing, and loyalty. Outside Valhalla, on the moors, a figure of a man, stands watch. His skin is whiter than alabaster, and his golden armor and helmet glimmers in the bright sun of Asgard. On his belt, this ever-vigilant guardian carries the horn, 
Gyalahorn, with a loud virtue, an echo that would not subside once the horn is blown. This lone guardian was set before the rainbow bridge of Bivrost to guard the entrance to Asgard and the dwellings within. Heimdall the horn blower is charged by the Aesir to keep an eternal vigil and warn the High Lords of coming threats. No one is better suited for this purpose since Heimdall can see farther than any known being, needed little to no sleep, and could see such tiny details as the sprouting of grass or the growing of a sheep's wool. Nothing escaped this golden guardian's gaze, and thus, the gates of Valhalla were safe until the coming of Ragnarok. During Ragnarok, Heimdall will blow on the Jalahorn and alert anything with ears or anything with capability to hear. His horn rings so loud, it can be heard in all of the Nine Realms, as clear and loud, as if it was no farther than a few steps. When the horn sings, all of creation can count its days at an end, for everything shall be cinder and ash, until the new world rises from the seas. As the swords of the Aesir and their enemies clash, it shall be Loki who slays Heimdall, and the trickster will find his own end at the hands of the horn blower. A sparse few tales are there of Heimdall, an Aesir whose task was to stand still and stare at the worlds beneath Asgard had no time for frivolous adventures. Perhaps his focused nature was the virtue that saw him as the end of the chaotic and unpredictable Loki. Avanir, and the twin brother of Freya, Frey is the physical representation of male vitality and sexual vigor. He is the god of fertility, virility, and prosperity. Much like his twin sister, Frey enjoyed the comfortable and finer things in life. Not that our strapping figure of manhood was a wastrel, quite the contrary. Frey was known to wield a mighty sword known as Skirnir, and go into battles. Along with his brothers and sisters, he stood against the might of the Aesir during the aesir Vanir War, and charged valiantly on his golden boar against the mightiest beings in the realms. At the end of the war, according to the treaties of peace, Frey, along with a few others of his kin, was sent as hostages to Asgard in exchange for Mimir. During this time, Frey was seen more as an Aesir than a Vanir, and adopted their customs as he lived along with the mighty warriors as one of them. During his stay, Frey met the Jotun called Jurdia, and the two fell in love. As a condition for their marriage, Jurdia's servant insisted he gave up the sword he used in the war against the Aesir. He accepted, but this choice came at a cost. During Ragnarok, Frey would fight against the fire giant, Surt. Without his sword, Frey charged at the giant with a great antler, but lost his life in the fight. As decreed by Odin, those who fall in glorious battle, their swords drawn and battle cries in their throats, would find their souls ushered to Valhalla by the Valkyries, mystical flying warrior women. Before they could pass Bivrost, the Rainbow Bridge, the souls were greeted by a horrible figure, a woman half dead and half alive, whose one side is blue, like that of a drowned corpse while the right is bright and rosy, like that of a young woman. Those who look upon her, feel the true dread of death. Her name is Hel, goddess of the dead. Hel resided in the place in Niflheim, named after her. 
Her mansion stood past a fetid and gloomy swamp, and beyond a black lake. The shores of her abode were littered with the mangled and bloated bodies of the long dead, and their miasma suffocated the land in a foul cloud of vapors and vicious carrion. This daughter of Loki assessed who of the dead should pass into Valhalla, or should taken by her to her baleful mansion. Her spindly fingers poke and prod at the petitioners before her, as she searches for axe wounds, spear holes, or the lost shafts of arrows. Many have tried to scar themselves to fool the dark woman of the underworld, but mortal tricks are nothing compared to her power. Once upon a time, when Baldur was killed indirectly by Loki, the Aesir and Vanir wept for him and pleaded with Hel to release the beautiful youth. She agreed, but only if every single being in the realms would weep for him. This bargain would have succeeded if it were not for the Jotun, Thok, who refused. There are those who state that Thok was none other than Loki, looking out for his daughter's possessions. Njord, the wisest of the Vonir, and father of Freya and Frey, and their unnamed sister. This old lord of the Vanir was known for his powers over flames, seas and the winds. Unlike his offspring, Njord prized forethought and good counsel over the strength of arms. His calm nature is what would see him alive after the end, Ragnarok. Fishermen call upon his name and thank him for a bountiful catch, and those who honor him by assuming the thoughtful and serene form of Njord can expect a bountiful catch. Those who are not capable of such feats are better off drawing their swords and charging against the giants and spawn of Loki at the end of all things. Like Frey, Njord was a part of the hostage deal between the Aesir and Vanir after their war. As a sensible being, he took his new position with dignity and brought good counsel to the Aesir. Also like Frey, it was at this time the wise father of the Vanir found his mate in the halls of Asgard. The great hunter of the frozen wilds, the Jotun, Skadi, had lost her father in one of the unfortunate incidents caused by Loki. Seeking recompense for her father's death, Skadi demanded tribute from the lords of Asgard, a husband from their number, as she was now alone in her own halls. The Aesir agreed, but insisted she made her choice by the bare feet of the unwilling suitor. Pair after pair of feet walked past her gaze under a curtain, too wrinkly, too calloused, too misshapen, thought Skadi. She looked hard and long, until a beautiful well-groomed pair walked into view. She thought this to be Balder, the most beautiful of the Aesir, and called for the suitor to be revealed. The curtain flew up, and she saw the face of an old silver fox, the Vanir, Njord. What Balder had in male beauty, Bragi made up, in the gold of his words. This Aesir is the lord of poetry and scaldship, meaning the art of telling stories and sagas. It would be foolish to think that Bragi was another wastrel who spent his days reciting stories and fiddling with his instruments. After all, one must experience battles, strife and love, before one is able to sing of them. The Ain Hayar of Valhalla enjoy the company of Bragi, for who else would sing of their exploits, battles, and glorious deaths with such soul and power? It is one thing to die an honorable battle, but what good would that be 
if there were no songs or sagas to remember the hero by. The art of poetry and scholarship came to the world from the blood of Kevasa. After the Aesir Vanir War, a truce was made with the Aesir and Vanir lords, spitting into a cauldron to seal their oath of peace. This saliva would transform into the being known as Kevasa, who roamed Midgard, singing songs and telling stories. Kevasa was killed by two dwarves, Fiela and Gala, who wanted to be as great as Kevasa. They mixed the amazing being's blood with honey and made a mead called the Mead of Poetry. Any who drank this mead would be turned into a master of words, either a scold, a poet, or a scholar. The lords of the realms noticed the art of tales and song erupting in Midgard and wondered when such a thing sprang from. Bragi recognized it and named it the blood of Kevasa, the very stuff of poetry. In Asgard, stood a cottage surrounded by tall grass, trees, and high piles of lopped boughs. Here, lived Vida, the Silent, a strong Aesir, who preferred solitude and tranquility over the feasts and hunts of his brethren, and good shoes over shield rings and swords. He saw and cheered for the exploits of the other Aesir and the deeds of Thor, but wondered why they were so worthy of mention. After the three trials of Thor, Vidar went to try the same himself, drinking the sea dry, eating a bathtub full of meat, and lifting the world serpent, Yormongonda, off the ground as one would, a piece of string. At the end of his feats, he shrugged and went back to his cottage to fashion more boots. No one has ever heard of this, since Vidar kept silent on the matter never giving the whole thing another thought. Vidar's peaceful life ended at the beckoning of Heimdall's horn when the sons of Loki attacked Asgard, and the realms were plunged in the flames of Ragnarok. At this time, the Silent One had fashioned an excellent pair of magical boots, made from discarded soles and heels. As he went to show his proud craft to his father, Odin, he saw the awful Fenris wolf, swallow the lord of Asgard, Paul. No longer was Vidar silent. He yelled, dismayed, and ran stomping, and sword held high towards Fenris to save his father. The wolf stretched its black jaw around Vidar and tried to chomp the youth as a chaser for Odin. The great wolf, unknowing of Vidar's might, opened his mouth to his own demise. The boots of Vidar smashed Fenris' black tongue through his bottom teeth, and his mighty arms ripped the top asunder, as if it was paper. However, this deed of unbelievable valor came too late. As the last battle ended, Vidar had survived, embracing the still body of his father. Idun, the Aesir of eternal youth, and apples, and the wife of Bragi the poet. This fair dame was highly prized in the halls of Asgard, for she kept an orchard of special golden apples, known for their rejuvenating properties that stayed the advances of old age. The gifts of Idun were known throughout the realms, especially to the eternal enemy of the Aesir, the Jotun. Once upon a time, Thejatsi, the Jotun, roamed the snowy forests of Midgard, and chanced upon Loki and Thor on a hunting expedition. The two had caught a bull and planned to eat it as their meal. The Jotun noticed this and transformed into an eagle, sat on the branch of a tree and cursed the fire, 
removing it of its virtue of heat. Try as they might, the meat of the bull would not cook. Fejatsi revealed himself in eagle form, and said he had cursed the fire, but would give its virtue back if they would give the eagle a piece of their feast. The Jotun ate so much, Loki had to stop him before every scrap was gone and charged at the great beast with a spear. The eagle dodged and grabbed the spear, taking Loki to the skies with him. For untold leagues, Loki's feet smashed against the tops of trees and stone piles. He pleaded for the eagle to stop and bring him down. Fejatsi agreed, but only if Loki would bring him Edun and her apples, which he did. With Edun and her orchards gone, the Aesir grew old and grey. Loki, realizing his mistake, went back to Fejatsi to steal her back. Using the same trick, Loki transformed into an eagle and Edun into a nut and carried her away. Fejatsi, realizing this subterfuge, chased Loki as an eagle as well. As they approached Asgard, the other Aesir noticed Loki was being chased and shot Fejatsi down to his death. The Jotun's daughter, Skadi, swore vengeance against the Aesir but was recompensed with a marriage to one of their court, Njord. Mimir, the keeper of the fabled well, the knower of many secrets, and law. This solitary figure sat on the moors of Memesbrunner, attending his well and sharing its waters with those he saw worthy. Once upon a time, Odin came to Mimir in his ambition to rule over the realms and sacrificed an eye to drink from Mimir's well. As the Allfather quaffed, he learned all there was to know about anything and all knowledge of what was to happen. Mimir saw his end in the Aesir Vanir War. Caught unaware, the Vanir came to he, who aided the chief of their enemy, and hewed off his head with an axe, so his wisdom could never help anyone again. Odin, knowing of the wise Mimir's demise, collected his head and brought it to life with special spells and potions. The Lord of the Aesir kept the head as counsel until it was given to the Vanir as a part of the hostage exchange. Odin and Mimir knew that the everlasting peace between the two warranted the death of the Law Keeper. Had the Aesir and Vanir not fought as one in Ragnarok, the conclusion of the Battle of Battles would have been worse, if not an absolute nightmare. For Sati, the Lord of Gold and Silver, was an Aesir, who lived in the Gold and Silver Hall of Glitnir. For Sati's task was as arbitrator and accountant of the Aesir, dealing justice and financial arbitration between the Lords of Asgard as virtue of his just and meticulous mind. While the Aesir would prefer to solve their differences with a good fistfight, Odin decreed, that in order to retain unity and peace in Asgard, an arbitrator should be named, so that the warlike Aesir would not turn the realm into a bigger tavern of brawl than it currently was. It was bad enough that a number of uncountable Ain Heir roamed the halls of Valhalla in a rampage of hunting, drunken merrymaking, and killing each other, while a giant black wolf lurked in the forests as the Jotun raided Asgard and kidnapped Aesir maidens for their apples. In the end, the arbitrator kept the peace between the Aesir and the realm struck together as one in Ragnarok.
Ula, the son of Sif, from a previous marriage, and the stepson of Thor. Ula possessed a magical shield, known as Ula's ring, ring, being a metaphor for shield. This Aesir can be described as the shield carrier of Asgard. While the others charged, Ula held his shield aloft, guarding his brethren from blows and arrows. He was also the oath keeper of the Aesir. When his kin wished to swear important oaths, they would swear them upon Ula's ring. These oaths kept the shield unbreakable and impenetrable, as long as the oaths themselves were not broken. Uda would sail on this shield because of its buoyant virtue, and if he sunk, the Aesir would know a sacred oath was broken. The son of Odin and the Jotun, Reindeer. Vali's birth had not been foreseen by Reindeer. In fact, she had no idea Odin had impregnated her when he came to her hall, dressed as an old woman, and laid with her. The result was a boy who grew to adulthood in a single night, for a single purpose. Odin, knowing of the fates of his kin and the realms, from his ritual of self-sacrifice and drinking from Mimir's well, knew a son of his would find his fate in avenging Baldur's death after Loki shot the beloved Aesir, disguised as a blind old man. But what Odin's vision showed him was that an old man had killed Baldur, and Vali would slay him. The old man Vali slew was Hoda, whose visage was that of the murderer, but in truth was innocent. Upon realizing the error, Vali swore upon Ula's shield to make amends for his mistake and never bathe or groom himself until justice was done. Vali found the culprit, Loki, in a pond below Asgard, disguised as a salmon. He bound Loki to be tortured by a poisonous snake as punishment before the trickster's escape upon the eve of Ragnarok. Sif, the wife of Thor, and the lady of golden fields of wheat and vegetables. This maiden of the Aesir was not half as wise as Frigg. She was unskilled in Edun's craft of growing magical fruit, and hardly as strong as Skadi's little finger. Sif was as simple and uninteresting as an immortal being could be, and the perfect wife for the bull-headed violent Thor. Her name means arranged marriage. Once upon a time, during one of his mischievous rampages, Loki decided to cut the golden locks of Sif in her sleep. As Thor came to his bedchamber to see a bald maiden on his bed, the Thunder Lord smashed through his wardrobe where he heard the snickering trickster. He threatened to break every bone in Loki's body for this insolence. Sniveling, Loki pleaded for his life and promised to deliver something wonderful to Thor, as an apology. Thor agreed, but still broke the trickster's jaw, as he sent him out. Loki went to the cave of the dwarves, Brokkur, and Sindri, pleading with them for gifts to appease his debtors. The two saw the wretched being, with his bleeding lip, black eye, and ripped clothes, and decided the creature before them could not afford anything from their forge. Loki was not stupid. He sighed, theatrically, and said he would go to the dwarf's rival to get something better from them. Angered, Brokkur and Sindri, in an attempt to prove Loki wrong, fashioned a new hair for Sif and Mjolnir for Thor, in addition to a few other weapons, but demanded Loki's head as payment. Loki refused to give his head to the dwarves, 
as his neck was not a part of the bargain. The dwarves sewed Loki's lying and scheming lips closed instead, and left, satisfied with their compensation. <laughs>